Hello again. My name is Steve Hillis, and this is the last in our series of uh, lecture videos on uh, crime and criminology. In this video, we're going to look at some social biological theories to understanding crime. Here we have a picture of Caesar Lombrusso, 1835 to 1909. Caesar Lombrusso was an Italian physician and social scientist, really one of the founding fathers of modern criminology. Caesar Lombrusso basically tried to explain crime in terms of biological causes, inherited traits that predisposed people to commit crimes, or at least be more likely to commit crimes. Now, Caesar Lombrusso never said that every criminal or every crime could be traced back to biological causes. Nevertheless, he believed that biology played a critical role in shaping who was the most likely to be serious criminals, repeat criminals, winding up in jail and so forth, and who was not, who was law-abiding and who was deviant. Caesar Lombrusso believed that many criminals basically were biological throwbacks, atavistic. They were not as evolved as the average person. If you've ever seen the movie Lord of the Rings and you remember the character of Gollum, that's, well, a little similar to what Caesar Lombrusso described when he was describing biologically uh, inferior, biologically uh, uh, atavistic criminal populations. People that looked different than the average population. They were sickly, they were scrawny, they had bad teeth. They had, well, all sorts of abnormalities in their skeletal structure, big cheekbones, the list goes on. Caesar Lombrusso uh, arrived at these conclusions by studying actual criminal populations in prison in Italy during the 1800s and then comparing what he found there in terms of his medical studies, his autopsies of those uh, 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 prisoners when they died. And he, he compared what he found when he studied those criminal populations to what he found when he studied Italian soldiers. And he became convinced as he went along that there were clear, obvious, visible biological differences between criminal populations in Italy uh, versus uh, non-criminal populations in the Italian army, leading him to the belief that, well, crime was rooted in biology and that there were so-called born criminals. Now, Lombrusso's arguments were very popular in his day, but they're open to very serious criticism today. Frankly, a, a lot of his findings simply don't hold up. Uh, if you go back and you look at some of the original skeletons or skulls that he uh, wound up studying and measuring, claiming to find, among other things, that prisoners had smaller brain cavities, little brains. They were, well, not as evolved. Well, it turns out that some of those skulls were saved, and you can go back and actually replicate his research. And it turns out that the, uh, Caesar Lombrusso may not have been the most, uh, uh, the most competent of scientists when it came to doing these kinds of measurements. His research really doesn't hold up to very critical evaluation. More importantly, there's a whole range of reasons to believe that criminal populations don't look that different don't have clear physiological differences from the general population. In fact, criminals today in jail look very different than criminals did during the time of Caesar Lombrusso, which once again gives us a strong reason to believe that you know, Lombrusso was probably wrong about born criminals. After all, it's only been a less than 200 years since he started doing his research, really uh, significantly less than that. And we haven't had enough time for criminals to evolve, to become muscular and, and so forth, like you see so many male prisoners in U.S. jails today. Lombrusso's criminals were scrawny and missing teeth and, well, sickly. Many criminals today are anything but that profile. Perhaps more importantly, Lombrusso simply never seriously considered alternative explanations for what he observed. Clearly, he did study a lot of sickly, deformed people in jail, but why? Maybe some of that had to do with the fact that, well, he was studying people from lower class origins in Italy. And this was a time when Italy was very poor. There were a lot of people that were suffering chronic diseases, malnutrition, and frankly lived a hard life. So of course they were missing teeth. They didn't go to dentists. Of course, they had all sorts of physical abnormalities. They were sick. They had uh, all sorts of vitamin deficiencies and so forth. For a whole variety of reasons, 
They were hunched over and weird looking and deformed because of socioeconomic and environmental reasons, probably as much or more than any biological reasons. For these reasons and others, many people began to reject Lombroso's arguments. And by the 1950s, roughly, uh, a lot of these biological arguments uh, for causes of crime really began to lose support, really, actually, quite a bit earlier than that. Although I will point out that some people continue to argue that crime had some kind of biological cause or biological roots. Even so, the uh, strong evolutionary, the simplistic evolutionary arguments made by Lombroso were largely rejected by the mid-1900s. By the mid-1900s, biosocial theories of crime and violence fell out of favor in criminology, although such an approach never disappeared. Still, evidence was slowly gathering that would lead to a rebirth of biosocial criminology. Over the past several decades, research by some criminologists, biologists, and evolutionary social scientists has given mixed support for the claim that biology plays an important role in crime and in deviance, in violence. And here's just a brief overview of some of the more compelling evidence that biology may very well play an important role. First of all, we're going to look at inheritable factors inheritable biological factors that appear to contribute or may contribute to crime, violence, deviance. Inheritability studies have shown correlations between criminal or violent behavior of biologically related people. Correlations between the behavior of parents and their children, between siblings, between twins, between identical twins, and between other sets of relatives. The closer the genetic relationship, the stronger these correlations tend to be. For example, the criminal histories of identical twins is more strongly associated than for fraternal twins. The correlation is stronger between brothers and between cousins. It's stronger between first cousins and second cousins and so forth. These results still hold up to a lesser degree. Even when we study children who are separated at birth and raised separately. So for example, when you look at twin studies, looking at correlations between their behavior. You can look at kids who were isolated, separated, at birth, and still find substantial correlations between their criminal behavior, their violent behaviors, even though they may never have met each other. Now, we have to be careful because some of this research is a little shaky, simply because trying to separate and isolate biological effects from social and environmental effects is very tricky. So for example, in the twin studies, a lot of times twins that were separated at birth may still have known each other. Maybe one was raised by a parent and the other one raised by a family friend or an uncle or an aunt, maybe a grandmother. So they were still maybe in contact or at least raised in similar households. And even if they were raised by completely different people in completely different towns, a lot of times they were, they were raised in very similar environments at more or less the same time, the same culture. And all of those things might, well, lead them to have a lot in common, even if biology played little or no role. Now, I'm not suggesting that these uh, twin studies are not suggested. They are. But they're not definitive. Discovery of criminological families with extended histories of criminality Criminologists have found some families that show, well, impressive long-term uh, uh, tendencies towards crime. For instance, you find criminal, uh, criminological families where male members of the family, generation after generation, dating back, well, multiple generations, 10, 12, 13 generations in some cases, uh, where almost all of them have extensive criminal records, histories of violent behavior, and so forth suggesting that maybe there's some biological reason for uh, crime and violence running in the family. Research may have identified genetic characteristics like genes or chromosomes associated with criminality. In the past, such uh, claims have not withstood investigation. An example, back during the 1960s, there was a famous case with a, 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 a spree killer named Richard Speck who killed several nurses made all the national news. Some people claim that he had a, 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 a chromosomal abnormality. 
that lent to him becoming this violent super criminal. And some people went further claiming that all men that had this chromosomal act, uh, abnormality would be predisposed to crime and violence. It turns out that later research would show that there was a very loose, very weak relationship between this particular abnormality and violent crime and crime in general. Apparently, it was mostly because men that had this abnormality were more prone to lower IQs and mental retardation. So people with those tendencies a lot of times get in trouble simply because they may not be able to control their impulses, they may not understand the consequences of their behavior, or for that matter, they may be falsely accused. For whatever reason, men that are a little slow are also men that tend to have low-level criminal records, a little more than the general population, although it's not a huge effect. Not super criminals. Not the original claims. In fact, it turns out that Richard Speck actually didn't even have the uh, abnormality in question to begin with. That was just a false rumor. The more general point here is, is that uh, um, these kinds of claims really a lot of times have been shot down in the past. Arguably, the best candidate today is MAOA, a gene related to neurotransmitter production. Men with this genetic marker seem to be more prone to criminality, especially violent criminality. But it is not an all-purpose crime gene. At most, uh, possessing such a gene might increase the risk of criminality under some environmental conditions, but not others. In fact, there's some research that suggests that really is the case with MAOA. That, for example, if you're a boy with this condition and you're raised in a really bad environment and you have some other problems, that then and only then are you more predisposed towards aggressive or violent behavior. On the other hand, if you're raised in a really good environment, uh, it appears that maybe it doesn't have, it has little or no effect at all. So again, it's very environmentally contingent. Many people who carry MO, uh, pardon me, MAOA have no records of crime or violence. And many criminals uh, do not carry the, uh, the, the, uh, the gene. So some people have it and don't commit crimes, and some people don't have it and still commit crimes. That isn't meaning, that does not mean that MAOA or possibly other kinds of genetic markers. Uh, might not contribute or cause criminal behavior, at least make it more likely. Nevertheless, the uh, evidence here is really mixed, and it's an open question how much of this will hold up under further investigation.